Hello writers, come ride with me. My name is Michaela Greenwood. I create worlds for mind adventures. Welcome to my channel, Write with Michaela. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell so you can go on this journey with me. Today is Friday, which is story time, or the day of our chapter exchange. <coughs> Excuse me. If you are writing with me and you wish to exchange chapters, then send your chapter with written permission to writewithmichaela at gmail.com. I will post the email address at the end of the video. Uh, I am looking forward to reading your chapters. Even if I can't read them all on the channel, all chapters read on Fridays, whether they are mine or another writer's work, are copyright protected material and no one may use any part in writing their own stories. This story is PG-13. If you're under 13 years of age, you need parental guidance. The story, uh, this story is in its rough draft stage. This is the last two stories we've heard. The title of the story is Eleni's Pride. And today we are reading chapter three out of book one. If you would like to read along, then send to the email I stated earlier and request a PDF of the chapter. Make sure you're specific about either City of the Ancients, Tahia, Eleni's Pride, Breaking Point, because Eleni's Pride has three books, so the subtitle is Breaking Point, and which chapter. Now, let's start. Eleni's Pride, Book 1, Breaking Point. This is Chapter 3, Full Moon. Libya had turned this way and that way. She had straddled this branch and that branch. She had leaned her back against the trunk and had placed her bundle against the branch she sat on. She had leaned her front towards the trunk with her bundle between her and the trunk. Sleeping in a tree was very uncomfortable, but it was a better option than waking up to find dogs eating you. Finally, Libya had fallen, fallen asleep from sheer exhaustion and not from comfort of any kind. This is how Eleni found her, sleeping in the tree, leaning into the trunk with her bundle between her and the trunk. Eleni could see the bundle had slipped down and the girl's face was against the bark. The way Eleni found her was the girl had the tip of her foot touching a lower branch and the foot just slipped down and swung back and forth a few minutes. Eleni looked around at the landscape and within herself she felt way too close to her unknown enemy that the orb warned her about. She wasn't in the habit of waking anyone. Well, to be precise, she wasn't in any habits. So she didn't know if she should wake the girl or if she should just sit and wait. Eleni decided to wait since the sun was high in the sky and it was hot outside. She curled her tail around herself and decided to rest herself. After a couple of hours with the sun about a third of the way down, Eleni decided to wake the girl. She wanted to use the rest of the light to get back to the cave. Granted, she had flown partway here but she didn't want to fly in the dark. Eleni gently blew wind towards the girl, and she was careful not to blow her out of the tree. Libya stirred a little. Then a tumultuous sound filled the air and startled her awake. Her and Eleni both looked northeast toward the sound as black dots filled the air. They were both on full alert. Eleni lowered her head. Even though she was well below the tops of the trees, she didn't want her enemy to see her or sense her. As she lowered her head, she gently blew on the girl again, and then she linked with her and sent these thoughts. We need to get out of here. I don't like being this close. Livia looked around and then was so startled when she saw Eleni that she almost fell out of the tree. Oh my goodness, I didn't see you there or hear you approach. Are you a dragon? I am your dragon and you are my girl. You don't need to talk out loud. We are linked. Libya adjusted her bundle a little so it didn't fall. I, I wasn't taught that. 
come to my birth cave and listen to my message. We both have a lot of learning to do before we can let the enemy find us. Why are they... Why are they flying to my village, thought Libya, as she tried not to speak. I can't answer that. Come, we need to move away from here. I'm feeling vibrations, so I don't know what that means. Libya took her bundle and leaned down as far as she dared, and then she dropped the bundle. Then she carefully climbed out. She gathered up her bundle and followed the dragon after the dragon turned around. After a few steps, she ran to be beside, to be side by side with the dragon's head. How, how far is your cave? Too far to walk, but once we pass the trees on the other side of the ridge, I will fly low in the valley over the long pond. Libya didn't know what else to say to the dragon, and she was tired from her restless sleep, so she just walked along beside the dragon up to the ridge. The dragon turned this way and that way, picking out their path. So Libya didn't really think about climbing a mountain without her hands and arms. But the path was what Eleni could do without hands. Trees went up the mountains to a certain point, but then they stopped. Before continuing, Eleni glanced up to, in the sky to make sure no black dots were flying. Excuse me. No black dots were flying their way. Come, there's a passage just up this short incline here. I think if we get into the narrow passage, the enemies won't see us unless the enemy dragons fly over the mountains looking for us. Libya just nodded her head and tried to watch where she put her feet. Stepping on the rocks had her skidding down a few times already, and she was tired, so she wasn't processing everything. Roman was tired of walking, and he wanted to sit, but a strange odor hit his nostrils. It was different from before, almost like a skunk or something. At least that's the name he thought he remembered his dad telling him. He looked around and tried to find where the smell was coming from. The sun was still too bright for him, and he had walked quite a bit with his eyes half closed, but he wanted to know what the smell was. If it was truly attached to that little animal and not something to worry about, except the odor being unpleasant. He held onto the bundle with one arm and shielded his eyes as he tried to look around more. Then he heard a terrible roar that scared him so badly that he dropped his bundle as he jumped. He looked towards the sound and saw some creatures in the sky. They weren't close enough for him to make them out especially not from within the trees, and he had never seen a dragon before. He had only heard about them from his paw. Roman pushed up his sleeve and looked at the mark on his arm, and he rubbed it. He said in a low voice to his arm, Where are you? Are you flying towards me with a whole bunch of friends? He didn't expect an answer, but he received, I know flying. I know friends. I tired. I take naps. Roman stood for a few minutes, staring at his arm. He was trying to decide what the strange thoughts in his head meant. He remembered some of his father's stories about people who had become senseless and had voices in their head. So he, he rubbed his arm again and said, Are you a dragon? If you are, then you're supposed to find me and fly me. And we're supposed to fight those things that are coming for me. Roman received, I dragon. I no fly right now. I tired. I sleep. I find you later. Roman stood looking at his arm a few more minutes till the roaring penetrated his being. He decided it was foolish to stand there. So even though he was tired, he picked up his bundle and headed east away from the creatures in the sky and their roaring. Once he could bear the sound or it was much less because of the distance then he would lay down and sleep too. Coulter heard the terrifying sound, which caused him to jump. So many scary things were in these woods. He had seen birds, butterflies, spiders, and toads, but he didn't have names for any of those things, so they all scared him, especially the menacing-looking bird. 
He heard the roar again and looked over his shoulder. He couldn't see anything except the trees and more trees. Then he looked up and saw some black dots in the sky in the distance. Coulter became double scared. He didn't know why he had listened to the older boy, the other boy. Why did he listen to him and leave his home? He looked behind himself again and, <coughs> excuse me, all the trees looked the same. He didn't think he could find home again. The thought that the things in the sky were flying towards his home didn't enter his mind. Then Coulter saw a bush near a rock. He set the bundle down near the rock and crawled under the bush. He hugged his knees to his chest and rocked himself back and forth. Tears rolled down his face. He was scared and alone. I didn't know what else to do. Dragons landed in the valley surrounding the village. The villagers were outside doing their chores, but they all stopped and watched nervously as the armored soldiers and a few dragons entered the village. This was not a normal full moon visit. A visit during the day was always bad. The few dragons that entered came in the village on the north side, and one of the dragons breathed fire on three houses in the north. One man quickly dropped his hoe and ran in to get his wife and baby out. Another man looked at the dragons and the soldiers, and he saw them not stopping the other man. So he too ran to his house to get his wife and toddler. A third man followed close behind. He would have to help his wife get her mother out of the burning home. The villagers didn't know why they were receiving such wrath or how to prevent it, and they were too scared to protest anything. Protest meant death. So villagers exchanged glances, but no words or gestures. Aldemnia immediately recited in her mind the prayer her grandmother had taught her, and she automatically thought to extend it over Talta, even though Talta was inside with her mother, as she thought to extend it over Kinsesi. She glanced around at the others, and she wished she could extend the prayer over the other young children, but she didn't know how exactly the prayer worked. Trenton watched his father. He hoped his father would control his anger because he knew the soldier's presence and sensed his father. They just finished burying two small children this morning and the soldiers had taken four men to the mines last night. Trenton had heard his father mumbling about how would they now be able to get the woodwork done that they needed or who was to milk their two cows and three goats, just who? and his father had thrown up his hands. Then his father mumbled something about, what if the soldiers forgot who they killed or enslaved? Trenton had stayed on that thought. What if they didn't remember? And then they didn't count that person. What then? As Trenton watched the soldiers burn the houses, he knew none of the villagers mattered to the soldiers. So, why would the soldiers remember who or how many they killed? His chest tightened with fear and anger, and he almost couldn't breathe. Then a hand landed on his shoulder. The hand was his father's, and his father was trying to calm him down. So Trenton forced himself to breathe. A lead soldier motioned to a few others, get all the people out of their homes. We're doing a thorough search. He pointed at a couple of soldiers. Build up the fires and have the villagers sit with their backs to the fires as they come out. The soldiers set about those tasks and the villagers watched them. Mostly it was women and young children in the small homes. So the men watched, anxious to protect, yet knowing there was nothing they could do. The soldiers directed the three families that had exited first to one of the village fires. And several watched the last family the longest. The mother and father helped the older woman walk, and the two children had the mother's long skirt in their grasp, and they trailed along. Then the little girl started to scream, and the mother's hand quickly covered her mouth while the other hand still held on to her mother. Dread was settling in the villagers' hearts. They thought perhaps today was their death day. Many truly didn't know who had children hidden in their cellars. But 
That didn't mean the soldiers would believe that they didn't know. As more people were called out of their homes, the dread built within them. Children were extra scared, and parents would reach down and rub an arm or a back to calm them. But they didn't rub long, and they only rubbed when the soldiers seemed to be watching someone else. The soldiers had drawn their swords and told the men and boys to put down their tools and sit by the fires. So the men and boys had quickly dropped their tools to comply. Too close in their memory was when Franklin was complying, but he was easing down to drop the tool, and the soldiers killed him because he was moving too slowly. <clears throat> Women and children in the houses looked for their husband and father as they exited their home, and they quickly headed towards him. The people didn't like sitting so close to the fire. They could feel the heat, and they couldn't watch for embers. But that was the least of their worries. The soldiers were moving furniture and throwing out rugs. Other soldiers took up the rugs and tossed them on the fires. All the villagers knew that the soldiers were looking for their cellars. Most had cellars with escape tunnels. Cellars were for storage of extra crops or winter wood and such things. But without the soldiers in the village every day, they could continue to dig tunnels to have an escape if needed. Some tunnels had collapsed and some had water come in them. Those issues were known, but not openly discussed. Now, as the people sat with their backs to the hot fire, they could hear the soldiers moving furniture around and knew they were looking for something or someone. One soldier came out of a house and announced a dirty plate had been in the cellar. Roman's mom nervously spoke up and said her husband went down there to count their supplies sometimes, but the soldiers had taken him last night, so who, know, who knew how old the plate was? The head soldier said, we will verify her story once the others arrive. The villagers' hearts nearly froze at those words, and a few seconds later, any non-frozen hearts le left leapt up into the throats of the rest as they heard the barking of the dogs coming towards them. Brumman's ma was particularly thankful that they hadn't killed her. She knew that the soldiers were likely to kill her while she told about the plague, but not telling would have been death for sure. Bradley especially had his heart jump into his throat, and he was having trouble breathing. He hoped beyond hope that the boys wouldn't be smelt by the dogs. Then the soldiers in Jarson's home came out hurriedly, and the lead soldier turned his gaze towards them. Rats, sir, lots of rats, said one soldier. The cellar here has a whole nest of them. Jarson thought, perhaps they had done too good a job this morning. Should we burn it, asked the soldier. The lead soldier made a disgusted face. Sticking peasants. I'm glad they're not near the kingdom. He turned and motioned to another soldier, and that soldier motioned to his dragon. The dragon walked forward and stopped at the edge of the houses. Jarson's home was more central, so when the dragon breathed his fire, the fire hit the ones on the edge before Jarson's home caught fire. Lydia immediately thought of the blanket. She wanted it. She wanted to smell it and smell her sister, but she didn't move. She sat frozen with her chest tight. Jarson was sad that the other homes burned too. But who could predict what these soldiers would do? Shortly after that, the soldiers with the dogs came, and they sent the dogs down into the cellars to smell what they could. While the villagers didn't talk about the linkers, many of them knew the linkers should exist. Many had been alive during the prophecies and during the hiding of the eggs, when King Damon Tate had first taken over the kingdom and become a king. The dragons were part of their society at that point, and the dragons picked eggs to hide or laid eggs in faraway caves because the dragons felt it was wise to listen to the prophets, even though the dragons couldn't imagine turning away from the people they loved. Everything happened as the prophets prescribed, and King Damon Tate's dragons slaughtered friendly dragons, or he used a witch's potion to turn the friendly dragons against the people they loved. Thankfully, the potions that he used did
didn't cause the dragons to reveal the locations of the hidden eggs. In fact, the dragons had no accessible memories of the eggs. The king's prophets and the people's prophets had foretold of King Demonte taking over and making their lives miserable. But they also told of the linkers to be born, people to connect with the eggs once the eggs hatched, and those people and eggs would come together and overthrow King Damon Tade. Therefore, all the villagers knew the linkers should exist. Their hope for freedom depended on the existence of the linkers. And not knowing the identification of the linkers or, or whom the children belonged to also protected the linkers and their hope. The villagers watched the soldiers and the dogs and their chests kept getting tighter and tighter. They hoped the soldiers and dogs wouldn't find the linkers. But if there were no linkers, what hope did they have left? Embers landed on a little girl's dress, and the mother quickly patted them out with her bare hand. The embers slightly burned her hand, but she couldn't focus on that now, because dogs were bursting out of a few tunnels and sniffing the ground. The lead soldier immediately had his suspicions raised. Tunnels? You have tunnels? Jarson motioned to his burning home. Yes, to escape a fire. The soldier turned and glared at Gar Jarson. Jarson held his breath. He needed to keep quiet. But the soldier noticed the dogs coming out near them and not that far away. Hopefully, the soldier bought the story. The dogs sniffed the ground in circles, but they didn't follow any scent out of the village. Bradley wanted to watch, but he knew if he gazed at the dogs on the eastern edge, he might give things away. So he looked at the burning homes. So Flynn had packed her home and exited the tree trunk. And since it was still daylight, she set an invisibility charm on herself. Immediately upon exiting, she could see the smoke from the village. Usually there were three to five slim streams of smoke rising in the air, but what she saw was a plume. Her heartbeat quickened, and she was instantly glad she had cast a charm on Bradley, also because now he was the only one in the village she had a connection to. She thought through the connection. Don't jump, don't move, or stop moving. I'm so Flint, a witch. What's going on? Why all the smoke? Bradley had jumped a little, but no one seemed to notice. He thought, a spirit just crossed my grave. Actually, that's quite silly to think. I have no grave, so no spirit could cross it. He received, I am not a spirit. At least not yet. I'm a witch. You helped Broman and Coulter earlier, so I cast a charm on you. What's going on? Bradley thought, Broman and Coulter. That must be their names. The soldiers are here, and they know we have cellars. I thought they knew that, but they've burned a few houses, and they're searching for linkers. Broman and Coulter just left today. Their scents are probably still fresh. I don't know about the girl. Her house is burning. I want to thank you for your help. I magically erased immediate tracks and scents earlier, and then I came home to learn about you. You are special. Me? I'm nothing, thought Bradley. We haven't time to argue. We are in this together. I've lived outside the village and the kingdom because the soldiers would know me as a witch, and I didn't want to drink potions and have my enemy force me to side with them. Coulter wasn't supposed to leave so early, but now, with the soldiers burning homes, I'm grateful to you for getting him out. I don't want to distract you too long, so I'll check in. I'll check back in with you later. Bradley glanced around. Nothing had changed much, but one of the burning houses had collapsed, and rats swarmed out of the house that the soldiers burned because of them. He realized he had missed a few vital things, and he probably hadn't reacted. Hopefully the soldiers hadn't noticed, but he was sure his father had. The soldiers finished checking the homes and the cellars. They counted children checked the children's forearms for symbols, and then they motioned to several men to stand apart and not sit by the fire. The men didn't know 
if the soldiers were going to question them or slaughter them or what? The lead soldier asked Jarson, Is your wife pregnant? We hope so, he answered. His answer was true. They hoped. They always hoped. We don't have a rabbit, he added. The lead soldier motioned to a soldier who held a piece of paper on a piece of bark. Wife pregnant. Then he pushed Jarson to another soldier. Okay, you're going to the mines. You just burned my house! Jarson burst. His wife was shaking her head no, but Jarson didn't see her. My wife needs... A soldier behind him took his sword and swung. The soldier sliced off Jarson's head and Jarson's body collapsed to the ground and his head hit the ground and rolled. The wife had closed her eyes and hugged the children nearest to her to herself. The youngest daughter cried, Papa! And she started towards the fallen body. Lydia quickly caught her dress and pulled her back. Then she held her sister tightly and her own tears soaked her sister's dress. Dogs circled the body and sniffed. One soldier kicked at the body and moved it towards the dog. Go ahead, Dulcer. Clean it up. The villagers were horrified and looked away. Many didn't know how much more pain their chest could take as more dogs came to devour Jarson's body. More than a few vi villagers had vomit rush up their throats, but they did all they could to swallow it. A few nearly choked, so vomit spewed forth to which the soldiers grimaced and said things like, Stinking peasants! The soldiers near the dogs made room for them, especially once there were several dogfights that broke out. Then soldiers from around the village started coming in and giving reports. The soldiers found nothing more than the plate, and the soldiers with the dogs verified that the husband had been taken the night before. The soldiers hadn't found a trail that left the village from any of the tunnels. The last soldier asked the lead soldier, If two hatched, where else would they be? Although the soldier hadn't said what hatched or who they were, the lead soldier knew. He shook his head. I don't know. Maybe Browser gave us false information. He eyed all the villagers, felt they were all scared, witless, so they should be blurting anything they knew to save their puny lives. Then he motioned around. Just burn all the houses. If they're hiding someone, that someone will die. Several soldiers motioned to their dragons, and soon all the homes burned. While some soldiers were in the village, several soldiers were outside the border using scythes to cut the tall grasses of the plain so the fire wouldn't spread to the woods that encircled the plain and wouldn't have a chance to spread north to the kingdom. It was all part of King Damontade's plan. The villagers felt the devastation, but they didn't know that was the plan all along. They just concentrated on being alive and not thinking of their burning homes. Eleni and Libya had found a narrow, narrow winding passage, and finally they made it through. Eleni looked up in the sky over her shoulder, didn't see anything over the one, and profuse smoke over the other. So she thought to Libya, Come and climb on, up on me. I can leap up from here, but I can't leap up from inside the trees. I want to fly and get us farther away. Libya thought, Fly? I can't fly. We must. Climb on. Or tie your bundle to you somehow and then climb on. But how will I stay on, thought Libya. When men ride horses, they use saddlers or something to hang on to. You don't have anything. Eleni thought for a few minutes. Well, squeeze with your legs to stay on, and you can hold on to my whiskers. Take the strip off your arm and use it to tie on your bundle. Libya took several minutes to unwrap her arm. Then she started, she stared down at the black mark. She rubbed her hand over it a few times, and as she rubbed, Eleni shook herself. Oh, that feels odd, thought Eleni. Maybe that is how we communicate if someone else reads the thoughts. Libya looked up at Eleni, startled. People can do that? I thought only linkers... I thought only linkers could link with their dragon. I don't know what is possible. I was only thinking... 
Libya tried several ways to tie on the bundle until she was satisfied. Eleni lowered herself to the ground for Libya to climb up, and then once Libya held onto her whiskers, she leapt into the air. She didn't want to fly higher than the mountaintops, so she just flew over the treetops on this side of the mountains, and then she flew even lower as she got to the valley. Eleni spread her wings and glided over the pond, and as she did, she saw pictures of burning structures in the pond, and she watched them until she got to the end of the pond. Then she flew a little higher to get over the treetops on the other side of the valley. She hoped to find her cave easily enough. Libya didn't see the pictures in the pond because she was squeezing her legs around Eleni and she was squeezing her eyes shut. Close to the end of the flight, Libya noticed the wind blowing her hair and she relaxed as she felt the wind in her face. But she was very glad once Eleni was back on the ground. Eleni had done a good job of looking around, so she was able to quickly locate her cave. She had Libya press the button on the carp copper orb before she let Libya lie down, lay down and sleep. When Libya had pressed the button and started watching the message, she turned to Eleni and declared, Your name is Eleni! That's so pretty! I like that name. My name is Libya. Eleni thought to her, Libya is a pretty name too. Now watch the message again before you sleep. Eleni realized that Libya was tired. So once El Libya got up, she would get her to watch the message again and then put her orb in her bundle. Put the orb in her bundle. Eleni lay at the entrance of the cave and thought about the pictures she had seen in the palm. She didn't know what they meant, but she hadn't seen them the first time she had glided over the pond. Libya took her bundle apart. There were a few pieces of dried meat in the bundle, which thankfully hadn't gotten wet when the bundle went in the river. So she ate a couple of bites, and then she used the cloak to lay on, and the extra leather as cover. But that didn't work. So she switched them and lay on the various pieces of extra leather and used the cloak as a cover. It didn't take her long to go to sleep this time, but her dreams had her fidgeting. Brumman smelt smoke, and he didn't know what he would do if the woods around him started burning. He turned different ways and looked around until he saw smoke rising in the sky in the distance. He didn't process that the village might be burning, but he thought the smoke was far enough away, and he was tired. Brumman could still smell the poop that he had stepped in, although most of it was no longer on the bark. He found a broad tree and sat down beside it. He leaned against the trunk as he opened his bundle. He found a few pieces of smoked meat and gladly took a couple of bites. He saw a potato and was about to toss it out, but then he felt it was soft and thought the woman must have cooked it. He also had several vegetables from the older boy, some carrots and snap beans and celery and some round red and white things that Broman didn't recognize, but it seemed things Broman could eat raw. Broman didn't particularly like potatoes, but he bit off the end and found that the woman had cooked it. He thought to himself that he didn't know how to cook a potato. He didn't know if he could make a fire. His pa had showed him several times how to knock the stones together to make a spark, but they never had anything for the spark when they were in the cellar. He dug through a little more and found two more potatoes that were hard. Broman, Broman sighed and thought, Perhaps he could keep them. If he couldn't cook them, then he would toss them. After a couple more bites, Broman scrunched up his rags and laid his head on them. If his dragon was sleeping, then so was he. Coulter was tired, and his body was shaking. He couldn't stay hugging his knees forever. In fact, he had already let one knee down, and he sat on that foot. Now he eased himself to the ground and lay down. He was hungry and tired and scared, but sleep won out. So he slept all curled up under the bush. So, so Flynn hadn't moved too far from her tree because she didn't want to attract the attention of the soldiers or the dogs. She saw more smoke flare up to the sky and she knew there were more fires. 
She didn't want to think with Bradley because she didn't want to startle him or cause him to act unnatural in any way. As she thought unnatural, she thought of how bizarre this soldier's visit was. They usually came when it was close to dark, so that it added an element of fear for the villagers. Why exactly was it that they came during the day this time? Why were they starting so many fires? Then she noticed some soldiers north of her in the tall grasses, and they were swinging scythes. She was glad that she was invisible, and she was glad she hadn't moved much, because even if she was invisible, that didn't mean the soldiers couldn't hear her, or they couldn't see the grasses moving around her. The dogs could certainly find her by smelling the ground where she had tread. So Flynn dropped back a little south. She would get to the river and follow it to the edge of the plains. That would put her farther away from the two boys, but she couldn't let the soldiers find her. As she walked, she picked up once again her thread of thoughts of the soldiers' strange behavior. She knew long ago that she had heard rumors that King Damontade had captured the last known linker. She thought, would King Damontade have kept Brucer, Bra Browser? Browser, yeah. Browser alive all this time? Would Browser's symbol somehow alert him to the new dragon's hatching? Suddenly she realized that if that indeed was a possibility, then King Damon Tate would be furious. And if the soldiers didn't want to lose their lives, they would have to comb the village very carefully. Thus it made sense for the soldiers to come with some light. So Flynn heard the dogs barking too. So Flynn paused. She didn't want the, the soldiers to massacre the whole village. Of course, she didn't think she had the power to stop them either. She risked thinking to Bradley. Are you alive? She really thought he would be, since her charm hadn't alerted her otherwise. Are they killing people? Bradley didn't jump this time. Excuse me. In the last few... In the last few minutes, he had hoped for Soflin the witch to think with him some more. He wanted answers. He thought, I'm alive. So far, only Jarson is dead that I know. If people are in the cellars, he paused a few minutes. And then he thought, I wish I knew about the girl. I thought she was Jarson's daughter. But I never actually found her or her exit. She is, as you say, and she has left. Her tunnel was longer than any other tunnel and went almost to the tree line on the west side. She left last night, and I magically erased what trail I could. I saw a glow on her arm, so her dragon w has hatched. Roman's dragon should hatch soon. Roman, is that the older boy? Anyway, the older boy's arm, uh, the older boy's arm glowed early this morning. Roman is the older boy, confirmed Soflin. My guess is that rumors are true, and King Damontay captured the last known linker. His name was Browser, and I'm thinking Browser somehow knew of the dragon's hatching. The soldiers spoke of Browser, thought Bradley. Is there some way for me to get you to think with me, or do I just have to wait for you? There are ways. Let us think on this later. I don't want you to too distracted. Do not give up any of your information to anyone. I'll think back at dusk or when the full moon is at its zenith, depending on if I know if the soldiers have left or not. So Flynn left Bradley alone with his thoughts. <clears throat> Gonna lose my voice before we finish. He glanced around to determine what was next. The lead soldier told several other soldiers to throw fires down in escape tunnels. So they caught leaves on fire and tossed them in. Anyone down in the tunnel would die from breathing the smoke. Libya stretched and rolled over. The cave floor was not the most comfortable, but of course it was much better than the tree. Eleni noticed her movement and looked over her shoulder. If you're awake, we need to move. What direction did you use to head to me? Libya sat up and rubbed her eyes. Having voices in her head certainly wasn't something she was familiar with. Um, 
Well, I believe I was supposed to go west, but I turned to my right at the river. My pa told me to walk in the river and not straight across. That was supposed to help the dogs lose my scent or trail or something. But after I got out of the river, I turned back to my left. Once we got into the passage, I kind of lost track. Eleni processed everything Libya told her. It seemed like the girl was very open and honest, and this was the second time the girl had trusted her with knowledge that could lead Eleni to the girl's village. Then some information opened up in Eleni. What are the names of the directions? You said west? Libya rubbed her eyes again and thought some. King Damon Tate is north. Opposite of north is south, and opposite of west is east. Okay, thank you. I think I know direction now. Continue to tell me things. I think that helps information open up to me. But don't tell everyone you meet. No one else needs to know where your village is or where my cave is. Lydia nodded and then gathered her things and the orb. She took another bite of her dried meat before she rolled it up. Then she went and stood at the entrance to the cave beside Eleni. As she walked up to the dragon, she took in how beautiful Eleni was, and she let her hand glide along Eleni's scales. Eleni looked very approvingly, very approving at the girl, and knew that they were going to get along nicely. We are facing north, and I feel at some point we will need to go to King Damon Tate's kingdom to learn how to defeat him, but I don't think we are ready for that yet. We will head your original direction, west. Lydia nodded and followed the dragon's lead. They headed into the trees and down an incline off the ridge. Okay, writers, that is the end of chapter three. I need to go back and reread chapter two because I know So Flynn witnesses Romans and Bradley's exchange, but sometimes it doesn't but but somehow it doesn't seem like she saw the light on his arm from his symbol. So I'll have to edit that and make sure the details match. Um, I think it is, and, and I think it's good for me to point out these things to you. So you understand more about Rough Draft. I've probably read through book one three or four times, but it's still very rough. And, and there, there are still holes that I need to weave together. I was ad-libbing up there when Roman smelled the skunk because he, he, the fire hadn't started, so he wasn't spelling that. So it was a hole. I needed to weave it together, and so hopefully I'll have to go back and listen to the videos and type that into the book. But I want you as writers to understand and, and not to be discouraged that when you do edit runs or read-throughs, that that that's normal that's part of the process also i will sometimes wait a week or two before i do an edit run otherwise i will automatically read what i thought i wrote and not what i actually typed sometimes it's little mistakes like you type of instead of or or some, something smaller you you type you miss the h and you don't put the h on his so it reads is so sometimes the mistakes are really small, but they're going to be there. So it's for everybody. There's not going to be one person in the world that can write a type, a perfect manuscript for strike. So you're, you're going to have edit runs. And that's a good thing. You can add to your story, fill things out and stuff like that. So after I wait a week, after the story sits for a week, I have a better read. If I read aloud, like I'm doing for the channel, I have a better read. You will have to figure out what works best for you. Uh, some people say they read sentences backwards, which that doesn't make any sense at all to me, how that would help you. I guess that would just help to get the is and the his or th those kinds of things fixed. But for me, I wouldn't get the story and I wouldn't get the holes and stuff like that. So leave a comment on Coulter, poor Coulter. Would you be scared if you were hiding under a bush and hearing all the roaring is so loud? Would you be scared? What would you be thinking? Um, what about Broman? Uh, he's been out. He's been around certain things. He knows certain things. But what if you had thoughts in your heads? What would you think if you had thoughts in your head after you spoke to your arm? First of all, I don't know that I would speak to my arm, but he rubs it and he speaks to his arm. Would you believe those thoughts were actually there? 
Okay, and he does it the second time, like, okay, this is weird. What about Libya? What do you think about sleeping in a tree? What do you think about waking up and seeing a dragon right beside you in the tree you slept in? Now, hopefully, my readers have a sense of how these characters felt. Hopefully that I've got that to you. But what I want you to do, what I want you to comment is about you. How would you feel? And, and maybe it would be different than my characters. And I would love to know that, that if you, you know, if you felt a different way, like you thought rubbing your arm and talking to it was just really cool and awesome and not kind of strange, then I want to know that, you know, to see the different perspectives because we've talked about perspectives before. So I want you to comment about how you would feel if you were those characters and not how I described it in the book. Join me Tuesday for some more jargon, vocabulary, or another writing prompt. Leave a comment on what you prefer. Do you want more writing prompts? Do you like the vocabulary? Do you like the mix? of just different things so you just don't really know what we're going to do and then we come in and we just write something like all of a sudden we describe an, an alien. Um, and join me Friday for Eleni's Pride Chapter 4, The Last Linker, and Chapter 5, Breaking Point. So Chapter 5's title is the same as the book title. So this is kind of where the, the breaking point will happen. Chapter 4 is really short. So we will read both four and five. Visit my website, buymckella.com, and read some character bios. Leave a comment on which characters on the website are your favorites so far. Or from the stories. If you've been with me on this channel and you've been watching all these stories, then you can tell me which characters are your favorites. Don't forget to hit the like and the subscribe and hit the bell so we can continue to write together. Thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate your participation. If you know someone who would like this video, then please share it with them. This is McKella with Write with McKella. Bye for now.